Uh, it is Resurrection Sunday. We're celebrating the fact that Jesus is raised from the dead and he is alive today. It's been over 2,000 years that we've been rejoicing and celebrating his being alive. But what does it mean to us? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the most significant event in human history. Amen. It is the most significant event in human history. Jesus walked the face of the earth as a real person, and there are so many evidence to prove that Jesus was real and he walked the face of the earth. But that's not what was significant. Jesus did a lot of miracles, signs, and wonders. That's not what is significant. Jesus actually suffered for us, bore our sin upon his body. Well, that is getting a little bit significant. He died on the cross, and then he was buried. But three days later, he was raised from the dead. For us as Christians, for us as believers, the resurrection of Jesus is the most significant event in human history. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, I know a lot of you uh, think that the death on the cross is the most significant, and, and that's why many of you, to show that you're a Christian, you would wear crosses and your necklaces. We will put crosses on churches like we have uh, in front of this one right here. Nothing is wrong with that. That is good. But the cross is actually not the most significant part of Christianity. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that is the most significant. Amen. If you were to create a symbol for Christianity, actually you should be wearing an empty tomb on your chains. Amen. You should go fashion an empty tomb and put it in, in, in some kind of pendant or whatever it is and put it on your chain or on your rings and tattoo it on your body and walk around with it. That is the most significant symbol of the Christian faith. It is really not the cross. Am I still in church this morning? Just stay with me. I am preaching the gospel truth. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, that death was real. But Christianity did not begin because Jesus died on the cross. In fact, after he died on the cross, it seemed as though all that he had done stopped ended. The disciples were scattered all over the place. They were afraid. They locked themselves up and the death on the cross had no power to begin the Christian faith. What began the Christian faith was three days later Jesus got out of the grave and when they went back to the tomb where he was laid, it was found empty. That was the singular event that had the power to start this revolution, this movement that we call the Christian faith. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It is not the cross. It is the resurrection from the dead that had the power to transform many timid men who had given up. The most significant event in the history of humans, in the history of, the, of, 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 of us as a people, is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Are you following me? Maybe you still don't believe me. There are many people who died on the Roman cross. How many of you know it wasn't only Jesus that was crucified? There were many, many, many people that were crucified. In fact, when Jesus was crucified, there were two others crucified alongside with him. That's why many times when you see pictures like this, you see three crosses. Somehow, you know that the one in the middle is the most important one. But let me tell you something. He was not the only one that was crucified. After he was crucified, there were many more that were crucified. What is the difference between his crucifixion and theirs? It is in the resurrection. There is only one person who has an empty tomb, who has a tomb that does not contain his remnant and his bone. And that's per that person is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that is why his resurrection is the only event 
that could trigger the Christian faith. Are you following me? He is the only one who died and was raised again to live forevermore. Today, all over the world, we're celebrating this resurrection. We're joyful that Jesus was raised from the dead. But unfortunately, many of us as believers don't even really realize the significance of this event for us. And that's why this morning I'm talking about activating new beginnings. I'm trying to bring just one aspect of the significance of the resurrection of Jesus to you and I. And so I'm trusting God that by the time I'm done in the next few minutes, you will have a revelation that will propel you to enter into a new dimension. Everything from Genesis chapter 3 up until the cross was building up for this moment. The moment when the tomb was found empty. At the beginning, God created all things and all things were declared good. At the beginning, God made man and he said to man, the day you eat of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. How many of you know that God created death? <laughs> it was God who created death. You see, because when life was made, by default, death became a possibility. Are you following me? Hello? <laughs> Are you following me? When life was made, death became a possibility. You see, a lot of people say, why is there evil in the world? There is evil because good is. The moment you create good, evil becomes a possibility. Are you following me? Words and opposites. <laughs> you cannot have something that is real without the opposite of it. Otherwise, that thing will not be real. Are you understanding me? The moment you create a $100 Canadian dollar bill, the possibility for a fake becomes a thing. If we do not have a real $100 bill, you cannot have a fake. In that sense, the fake will not really be a fake. It will be an original. Are you understanding me? How many of you have seen a $15 bill before? Is there a fake of it? No. If I created a $15 bill, then it's an original. It's not a fake because there is none other like it. Therefore, if God is good, the goodness of God in itself makes evil a possibility. It is just the law of life. When God created life, death became a possibility for man. But death was created without power. Death was not given power to kill. It was us men that gave death its power to kill by committing disobedience against God. Are you still with me so far? It's going to be a little bit deep to, uh, this, after, well, this morning and into the afternoon. I'd like for you to stay with me. I'm going somewhere. We gave death its power. In fact, the Bible says that death came into the world because of sin. It says the, the power of death is sin. And sin gets its power from the law. And so the moment we disobeyed God, the moment we sinned, death gained power and began to kill. The Bible says death came into the world through one man. And from that one man up until now, it reigned over all men. I'm preaching from the Bible. Let's read a few scriptures. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
Romans chapter 5, the Bible says to us, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin did what? Brought death. Adam's sin gave power to death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, People sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit command of God as Adam did. Death began to reign over everything. All around us, we see death. We see moral decadence. We see death in terms of life becoming old. We see the body of man dying. We see death in the nature around us. Death literally gained its power because of sin, because of disobedience. Sin is a very terrible thing. Sin is a very destructive thing. Sin, even though we enjoy it, we caught it, we think it is good, but sin is the deadliest thing that you can ever imagine. It brought catastrophe into the world through the instrumentalities of death, such that what God called good became so evil, he needed to wipe it out. And since that moment when man sinned, God began a process to defeat sin and therefore death. And so everything that happened, all from Genesis 3 and on and on and on up unto the cross, was building up for the resurrection. And I'll tell you why. Just before the event leading to the resurrection, we saw Jesus with his disciples at the Last Supper. We read that scripture in our first scripture reading in Luke chapter 22. If you read Luke chapter 22, 23, and 24, you will find all of the events leading to the death of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection. Just before Jesus uh, began to talk about his going to suffer and praying in to God, we see him at the Last Supper with his disciples. And he began to speak to them and says that, look, you have celebrated the Passover for many years, again and again and again. But he took the Passover and turned it around and said to them in Luke chapter 22 verse 20, he says, after the supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Jesus, at this last supper, was giving the disciples an idea that something new is about to happen. That there is something new that God is about to fashion out. That all of history from Genesis chapter 3 up until this moment, he has put something together that he is about to release. He has fashioned a, a, a certain dimension that he is about to give to them. And so he began to say to these apostles that this is the blood of a new covenant. The old is about to pass away. <laughs> and now Jesus says in verse 21, but here at this table sitting amongst us as a friend is the man who will betray me. All of the events leading on to the death on the cross and the resurrection, uh, Jesus began to help the people to see that there is something to deal with in man. At the supper where he was instituting the new covenant, he was saying to them that, look, one person uh, that is at the table is going to betray me. 
And in fact, if you read the passage, the Bible says they began to argue amongst themselves who that will be. Now, this is where my message starts. There is a flaw in man. There is a trouble with us. Uh, but here is the thing. When we begin to point that out in one person, the rest of us always seem to think that we do not have the same problem. When Jesus said, here at this table is a friend who is like a friend, but who is going to betray me? The Bible says in verse 23, the disciples began to ask each other, which one of them would ever do such a thing? The event leading up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ reveals our deepest flaw and it also tells us that it is in all of us. I'm going somewhere. When Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, everybody's like, it's not me. It's not going to be me. When we talk about the problem of sin, which is the issue that we're dealing with right here, right now, we have the tendency, like the disciples, to say, ah, not me. In fact, one of our deepest flaws as people is to pretend to be more righteous than we actually are. Mm. When we say somebody did such a bad thing, you're going to be like, how can anybody do that? How many of you are guilty? It is our floor. We tend to look at ourselves better than what we really are deep inside. We tend to look at other people and be like, I cannot be like that. Especially those of us who grew up in church. We tend to be the ones who pick up the stone and we're ready to throw it. But really and truly, if you look deep down, you are worse, if not for grace. Ah, is somebody understanding me? This is, the, we, this is one of the problems that we fo folks in church have. This is the problem that churches have, especially when we're dealing with the world. We tend to forget that this flaw that is in us is in all of us, except for grace. Uh, bear with me, I'm going somewhere. When Jesus says somebody is going to betray me, you are quick to say it's not going to be me. That it cannot be me, man. It just can't be me. In fact, when you go a little bit down in chapter 22, Jesus said to Simon, who is Peter, he says, Peter, Peter, the devil has desired to sift you as wheat. You are going to deny that you ever knew me. And Peter was like, Jesus, you, you got the wrong guy. He says, look, man, I am ready to die for you. I'm ready to go to prison for you. I'm ready to be out there for you. I'm ready to put my neck on the altar for you. And Jesus is like... You think so? This night, within the next 24 hours, you will deny that you ever knew me three times. And the guy is like, what? That can't be me. I, I'm your man, man. I'm, I'm there for you all the way. That is you. That is me. <laughs> You know, I always say this, even when you grew up in church and you'd never done stuff, the reason is simply this, God did not give you opportunity. You and I are as sinful as any other person down the street in our nature. It is a flaw that Adam passed to all of us. In fact, the Bible says those who did not sin in the similitude of Adam are sinners. Romans chapter 5. Have you ever tried to preach to anyone out there and they're like, I'm a good person. I do good stuff to my neighbors. I, I care for people. I I'm, a I'm really a good person. Really? The moment Adam sinned, you became a sinner. Yes, you. Don't look back, you. Yeah. 
You are as wicked as any other person in the world because sin resides in you. It's the deepest flaw that is in us because it was transferred to us. You had no choice about it. It's like the genetics that you got. So everyone is a sinner. And that's why the Bible says all have sinned and done what? Falling short of the glory of God. All. I don't care if you're the prime minister or a prisoner. All have sinned. And it is true. It is true. The moment Adam sinned and we all came from him, we were all subject to sin and to death. So much so that that good neighbor of yours, that person that seems to have it all together, they need salvation. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've missed it. We are all floored. You see, in fact, it is because God knows that we like to argue, we like to think we're better than we really are, that he gave us the law. <laughs> are you still with me? This is church. Don't keep your mind at home. Eh? Bring it here and write something down. Yo, write something down. Because I'm preaching good. The law was given not for us to keep, but to show that we are sinners, that we are flawed, that we need a savior. I don't care how nicely suited the guy looks and how well put together he looks and how much money he's got in his bank account. He is a rotten sinner. You are a sinner, rotten to the core because of the sin of Adam. <laughs> That's why God gave the law. And if you found anybody anywhere and you pass them through the test of the law, they must admit, if they are honest, that they are sinners. Ask them. If he's a guy, have you ever lost that after any woman? He will not be able to tell you no. Because the answer is yes. Yes. And you know what? Jesus says that is adultery. You see, when God said to them, thou shalt not commit adultery, they were like, okay, we got that. As long as I don't touch the woman, I can picture whatever I want in my head and all of that, I'll be all right. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Let's bring it to what God intends. If you ever look at a woman lustfully that doesn't belong to you, you've committed adultery. If you ask the person, are you a liar? Have you ever told any lie at all? Have you ever told the truth with the intention to deceive? You know, many of you are liars. <laughs> many of you are liars. You think as long as I did not say it, but as long as your action was intended to deceive, it is a lie. Are you understanding me? Many of your sisters up there, you're liars. <laughs> ah, yeah. Mm hmm Yes. Now they are, they are realizing. All those good stuff you said with the intention to deceive, it's a lie. It's not actually what you said that matters. It is the intention that you have. Do you know we tell the truth, quote and unquote, with the intention to deceive? And God calls it a... Have you ever taken anything that doesn't belong to you? The Bible says you're a thief. There is sin in all men. It is the deepest flaw that is in us, and it is the reason for death and evil in the world. And that is the subject matter that Jesus came to deal with. No man can escape the guilty verdict of sin, because we are all born with the sin of Adam. Are you understanding where I'm going to? 
That is why we as believers, we must be bold to proclaim the gospel. Quit looking at how good the person looks. Quit looking at how well put together they are. They are rotten sinners. If they have the chance, they will be worse than Hitler. You know, many of you are afraid to preach to people to tell them they need a savior. God gave us the law to prove that every man needs a savior. Even that girl that grew up in church. She is as wicked as the worst of us. Because that's resident in the nature of men. And that was what Jesus came to deal with. And you see, all of the event leading up to the resurrection, even apart from the law, showed that these flaws were in us. For example, Judas, he had already betrayed Jesus in his heart before he even came to dinner. Did you know that? Huh, turn to Luke. Let's read Luke chapter 22. The Bible says, The festival of unleavened bread, which is also called Passover, was approaching. The leading priests and teachers of religious law were plotting how to kill Jesus, but they were afraid of the people's reactions. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve disciples, and he went to the leading priests and captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted and they promised to give him money. So he agreed and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. You know what? I used to think that Judas betrayed Jesus because of money. No. But he betrayed Jesus because he was a sinner. The money only became a reward. Are you understanding me? You are a sinner regardless of circumstance. Do you know there are people who steal and they have no reason to steal? Like they have no physical need to meet with their stealing. They just steal. There are people who lie. They don't even know why they are lying to you. <laughs> they just lie. There are people who do stuff that they don't even want to do. In fact, Apostle Paul says, what I don't want to do that I find myself doing. Why? Because there is an inroad for sin in our lives to control us. It was only after they had discussed that they agreed to give him money. Even if they did not agree to give him money, he would still have done it. <laughs> Judas already decided to betray Jesus. Why? Not because he did not love Jesus. Not because he didn't like what the master was doing, but because he was a sinner. And before you go on blaming Judas... You remember what I said? You are just the same. I'm preaching to people in church today. That was resident in him. Judas betrayed Jesus. And okay, well, 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 that was Judas, you know. He was a son of perdition. But let's come to Peter. Peter here has been boasting that I'm going to die for you. I'll do whatever you want. I'm going to go all the way for you. But listen to me. The moment Jesus was arrested and, 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 and Peter was kind of trying to follow, still trying to keep to his word. It was a schoolgirl, probably maybe grade four or something, that says, hey, man, you, you belong to him. And he was like, I, I, I swear, I don't know him. Wow. Peter? You don't know Jesus? He gave you a fish <laughs> dinner the other day, multiplying bread and fish while you handled it. Oh, 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 before you forgot that, he gave you two boatloads of fish the other day. Your mother's wife was sick. You know when your in-law is sick? You yourself, you're sick. You have to do something about it. Jesus showed up and healed her. You've been with this guy three years. And you don't know him? My goodness. Peter, 
Now, but before you start to blame Peter, you were just like that. Just like that. Haven't you seen men who promised heaven and earth? Oh, you're the sugar butter in my tea. My chocolate. Where's chocomilo? <laughs> you know, all that stuff. And then three years later, they're telling the woman, I hate you. Get out of my life. I want to leave. You guys, hey, if you're watching online, remember your promise. I'm going to be with you the rest of my life. In fact, I cannot sleep without you. You are everything. Man, I will go crazy if you ever left my life. Remember? And now that same guy is looking for a lawyer to do an agreement and try to keep half of what he's got. You're worse than Peter. At least Peter was sorry after. You, you're not even sorry. You're like, I I have the right to be happy. I have the right to be happy. (laughs) Uh, Oh my, your sorrow just began. I'm preaching to somebody out there today. Maybe you people in church are too holy. You're not, you're just too good. Peter, he denied he ever knew Jesus three times. Look, Jesus gave him another opportunity and another one. And and the Bible says something funny. After the the, the third time and the cock, Jesus, Jesus turned and looked at him. You are a sinner. I caught you. Jesus turned and looked at him like, I I told you. (laughs) Why? Because the Bible says he knew what was in man. There is something inside of you that makes you a sinner. (laughs) It is called sin. Praise God. Now, before you start to think church people are bad, look at the people outside. They are worse. The religious leaders conspired against him. Religious leaders, the teachers of the law, they conspired against him. They wanted him dead. The soldiers arrested him. Now, the soldiers were supposed to be defending the rights of the citizens. They arrested him. The disciples, all of them, just before you think it was only Peter, they deserted him. All of them. James, John, even his own brother. You know one of Jesus' brothers was his disciple. They all took off. They deserted him. The rulers condemned him. The kings of his time, they condemned him. The people, all of the people, the Bible calls them the mob. They shouted, crucify him. I I can't get this. How a man could go all over the place, healing the sick, opening the eyes of the blind. And they knew it wasn't that they were ignorant of what he has done. Yet the same people shouted, crucify him. In fact, the Bible said they mocked him to say, well, you healed others, you performed miracles, get off the cross, man. How wicked is that? But it is not in them to be wicked. It is sin that is in them. No wonder Jesus prayed and says, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. The soldiers punished him, mocked him, spat on him, beat him within half an inch of his life, so much so that his face did not look human anymore. He had lost so much blood that he could have even died from the wounds alone. And then they nailed him to the cross. I mean, you heard the sounds of the cross. They let him down. His disciples let him down. But here is the gospel truth. We all let him down. Our deepest flaw is our capacity to let God down. That's what sin is. It says we are falling short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. If you can put that up. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. We all, all humans 
irrespective of who you are and how well behaved you've been and how well brought up you were, we have a deep-seated capacity to let God down. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Man has done many great things, many good stuff, many inventions, but deep within us is that capacity in our old creation to let God down, to flawlessly sin against God. It's an oxymoron. We do it so well, it is natural to us. Sin. And it is sin that gives death its power. That's why all men, whether they like it or not, no matter how rich or poor, will die. Because we're all sinners. We let God down in the beginning in Genesis. Adam did. God told him, obey me. Don't eat out of this. I'll take care of you. You can eat of everything else. But Adam let God down. And ever since, up until now, we have let him down. But glory be to Jesus. Here's where the good news starts. That on the cross, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus made one statement. He said, finished. You all don't understand the power of that word, finished. Jesus did not say, it is finished. <laughs> I know we quote it that way, translators translate it that way, but what Jesus said was one word on the cross. Finished! Finished. Finished. That was what he said. What was finished? What did he mean by finished? What was he attributing the word finished to? Unfortunately, we're English speakers. We need to look at the original word Jesus spoke to understand what he meant when he said, finished. Oh, glory be to God. You see, that word was one word, tailored in Greek. He spoke it as the last, and he committed his spirit to God the Father, and gave up the ghost. That word means to bring to a close. The Bible said Adam sinned. And from that day sin reigned over all humans. And death reigned over all humans. Everything Jesus came to do on earth was to bring one thing to a close. Sin and the power of death. He said finished. Meaning that he has brought to a close the old covenant. He had brought to a close the power of sin. He has brought to a close the power of death. Finish. To end. The same word means to pass. <laughs> As in a test. He had done everything well. He had satisfied God's requirement to end the reign of sin over mortal men. I told you everything God was doing from Genesis up until that moment was to bring a close to sin and to death. And Jesus on the cross presented all to the Father and says, finished. It means to perform, to execute, to complete, to fulfill. <laughs> this word is such a powerful word. You need to understand it. To fulfill so that the thing done correspond to what has been said. Does that remind you of something? God said that the, 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 the head of the serpent was going to be bruised by the seed of the woman. And when Jesus said finished, he was corresponding all that has been done to what God has said. That from here on, the head of the serpent is bruised. Are you understanding it now? It is to carry out the content of a command. God is a holy God. 
And sin must be punished. He cannot overlook sin because of his righteousness. Somebody had to bear the sacrifice for sin for all humanity. And since it was one man that brought all humanity into sin, that's what the Bible says, one man was also enough to pay for all of our sin. Unfortunately, that one man cannot also be a sinner. And so God had to provide for himself a holy, sinless sacrifice to pay for all our sins. So when Jesus said, it is finished, as we would interpret it, he only said one word, finished. Sin, finished. Death, finished. I told you, the power of death comes from sin. And the old finished. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant was fulfilled, was finished. That's why when Jesus sat at the supper, he told them, this is the blood of a new covenant. Because he was about to finish the old. Come on, say to somebody, it is finished. I say to somebody, finished! This thing about sin reigning over us, Jesus finished it on the cross. Our sins have been paid for. Our sins have been finished. That's the power of the gospel. The guy out there, irrespective of what he looks like, he may be richer than you, he may be well spoken than you, he may seem to have everything put together than you, but he is a sinner. And he needs to know that Jesus paid for his sin. Jesus has finished it. All that is required of him is to what? Believe. Our flaws have been forgiven. All that we need is to believe. How powerful is that? That's the gospel today. That men should believe that Jesus finished the work on the cross. All that the sinner requires is to believe. If you would believe on the name of Jesus and call on that name, you will be saved. Believe. Amen. Romans chapter 3, let's read verse 24 and 26. Thank you, Jesus. I'm trusting God. That after this service, you would have the boldness to proclaim the gospel to others. They are all sinners. But Jesus has finished the work on the cross. And all we need is to believe. Go back to verse 23. And and here was the first subject matter. Everyone has sinned. It is true. I just described it to you. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. All of us. Even the Prime Minister of Canada, he is a sinner. Yes, sir, I said so. I'm sorry, but it's true. It is true. He and all of the MPs, every one of them, they're all sinners. And I can prove it in court. He's lied to us many times. (laughs) Isn't it true? Are you afraid for your pastor? It's true. Amen. He's like you. (laughs) Even though he's the most powerful man in this country. But yes, he's a sinner. And that's why he needs Jesus. So if you were to meet him in Ottawa somewhere, tell him so. Preach the gospel to him. He needs a savior. Amen. Just think now in your mind. Who is the most difficult person for you to preach the gospel to? Your husband? Just tell him he's a sinner. Well, you know already. He's a sinner. (laughs) You live in the same house with him. But Jesus has paid for our sin. And it is true. He paid for it. And all we need to do is to believe. It's to believe that our sin has been finished on the cross. But much more than just the forgiveness of sin, the power of death 
has been destroyed. Maybe this is where this message is going to mean something to you in church because I know you all know that your sins have been forgiven. But do you know that the power of death has been destroyed? If Jesus did not finish it on the cross, everyone who died would have remained dead. But glory be to God because we know that because Jesus died on the cross and he was raised again, everyone who has died all through time will be raised from the dead. Even sinners. Amen. Do you know that? Everybody's going to be raised from the dead. Why? Because death's power has been finished. Death does not have a power to hold everyone down forever. A day is going to come when the trump of God will sound and the Bible says all the righteous dead in Christ will be raised and those of us that are alive will be changed to meet him in the sky. And then there will be a thousand years gap and everyone who has died all the way from Adam to the last will be raised from the dead. Because the power of death has been broken. And Jesus proved it by being raised from the dead. He did that so that those who die a righteous death can be raised and live forever in the kingdom of God. But unfortunately, all those who have refused to receive that which Christ has done, they will also be raised because the power of death is broken. Death cannot hold them down forever. But to live forever in damnation. That's really the gospel. That's really the gospel. And today we proclaim that Jesus finished death on the cross. And because of the resurrection, sin and death have been dealt with once and for all. Because of the resurrection, we are sure that we will be raised from the dead. Everyone that has slept in Christ will be raised from the dead. I don't know who you've missed as a loved one to the power of death, but hear this. Because Jesus died on the cross and he was raised again, they will be raised again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But before we get to that glorious day, here is how to apply this message today. The old is finished. The account of sin against us is removed. The Bible says he took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. <laughs> oh, glory be to God. The Bible tells us that the old finished and the new began when Jesus was raised. Here it is. Watchman Nee says our old history ends with the cross and our new history begins with the resurrection. And because of the death of Christ on the cross and the fact that he was raised from the dead, we can become new creations even now. And that's why I am talking about activating new beginnings. We were recreated as Jesus was raised from the dead. Do you believe what I'm saying to you? The old was really alive until the cross. But the moment Jesus ended the old on the cross, everyone who will believe in him can activate a new beginning in Christ Jesus. It is the most important truth of the resurrection. Look, you can believe that your sin has been paid for. <laughs> but you need to also believe that you are a new creation. That you can have a new beginning even now. It doesn't matter what the old looked like. It doesn't matter who you used to be. It doesn't matter what had trapped you in the past. But on the cross, Jesus made a way for you to pass from the old into the new. It wasn't just that the old creation was forgiven of sin. 
Listen to this and pay attention to it. It wasn't just that Jesus forgave the old creation of sin. But he made a way for us to become new creation. If he forgave the old creation of sin just like that, we will continue to live under the power of sin. Because that was what happened with the sacrifices in the Old Testament. They kept having to bring it again and again and again and again and again. Because their sins were forgiven last year, but there was no possibility for them to become new. So they had to come again the next year and sacrifice for another sin. But because Jesus was raised from the dead, as God fashioned for him a new body that could pass through walls, that could eat fish and be touched, he also began to make those who will believe in him as new creation. Somebody shout hallelujah. Mm. Because of the resurrection, you can begin again. You can be made new again. I mean, there are people here who feels like, look, I, I'm tired. I've tried so many times and I fail. But I'd like to announce to you, the old is finished. Do you believe? If you believe that the old is finished, you can begin again. You can move out again. You can enter into the new things that God has for you, practically and spiritually. The old is finished. You must allow the new to begin in your life. Many of us have believed, but we have completely shut out the new. We want to keep operating the old way. We want to keep doing things the old way. We don't want the new to work in our lives. You have to allow the new to come in. See, because of the power of, of the resurrection of Jesus, you can live anew. You can break free from the old. You can break free from old lifestyle, old addiction, old way of thinking, old mentality, old mindset, old circles. You can break free from that into the new. It wasn't just that your sins were forgiven and you were doomed to repeat them. You can be free. It says those who have been made dead with Christ, they've been raised together with him to the newness of life. Somebody ought to believe that for themselves today in the mighty name of Jesus. Say to yourself, the old is finished. I will let the new begin. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, I can have a new beginning. Just as the disciples had. Oh, look at the glorious thing. Peter, who denied Jesus. You know, in Mark chapter 16 verse 7. Jesus sent Peter a message. He says, tell the disciples and Peter. You thought Peter was all done. He was all messed up. He denied Jesus. I mean, he, he, he really messed up big time. But because of the resurrection, Jesus says, tell the disciples and Peter. You can begin anew because of the resurrection of Jesus. You truly can. Please put up that scripture. Let's read it. That will be the last scripture as we, as we bring this to a close. Mark chapter 16, I believe verse 7. All of those disciples who had deserted Jesus at the most critical hour, those who could not pray with him in the garden at the most critical hour, those who just did not believe him at the most critical hour, Jesus says, now go and tell his disciples, including, come on, including. Yeah. You thought the last look Jesus gave to Peter was, I'm going to deal with you, man. No. He comes back and says, go and tell Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. And the same message is for you today. Tell all my disciples, including you, that you can begin again. Peter thought he was done. In fact, he had gone back to the old, to fishing. He had gone back to fishing. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm out of the grave. You can begin anew. You can have a new beginning. You can activate a new beginning. As we close this morning or afternoon now, I don't know where you have failed. I don't know where you would messed up. You may have messed up in life, maybe with your children, maybe in your marriage, 
maybe in your finances, maybe as a young person. You may have messed up in all kinds of ways. But because Jesus was raised from the dead, you can have a new beginning. You truly can. You truly can. You truly can. I'll give you a couple of points. Uh, the leaders are going to come and begin to uh, pass out the communion. We're going to have a communion right now. And if you're watching from home, uh, you can get your communion element ready because we're going to get into this new covenant. But I'd like to say a few things to you. It doesn't matter where you have failed. Jesus does not come back from the grave and say, hey, Peter, come here. Now let's talk about you denying me. <laughs> no. He says, go and tell him. I am going ahead of him to Galilee. So you need to forget the past. <laughs> Is somebody here? In any area where you have failed before, you need to forget the past. Do not mourn the past forever. Many of you, there are things that you ought to have done for God and you truly messed up. You were like Peter who denied him. You deserted him. You left your post. You were missing in action. But Jesus says, forget the past. I'm doing a new thing. Don't mourn the past forever. I don't know where you messed up. I don't know where things kind of went sideways, especially if there are things that are still haunting you today, forget the past. Don't mourn the past forever. You've mourned enough. God has moved on from the past and is calling you into the new. Jesus is not saying, well, let's talk about the trial. He's saying, let's go to Galilee. You need to begin to accept the love of Jesus. And, and that's the real issue. Many people don't accept the love of Jesus. They want to keep beating themselves up again and again and again and again. But Jesus is saying, hey man, I love you. Come into the new with me. Come into the new with me. It's not too late to begin again, to begin your purpose. Somebody is saying to me, hey pastor, I've messed up two marriages. I have messed up, you know, I, I'm just, I'm totally lost. But Jesus is saying, just accept my love and you can begin again. You can begin to live right, right now. You may say, look, you, you don't know what I have done. I mean, I, I don't think God can love somebody like me. Well, while he was being crucified, he had already forgiven them. So if you would believe, it is not too late. You can begin your purpose right now. I know the last year and maybe year and a half has been hard. People have lost different things. Things have collapsed right, left, and center. But even in that, you can begin anew. You can begin again. Is there sacrifice for the new? Absolutely. You must learn to embrace the sacrifice of the new things that God wants to do in your life. Peter accepted the invitation of Jesus after Jesus came and said, Peter, do you love me? He says, I love you. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. This was the same Peter that really messed up. And as Jesus is calling us today, would you believe and embrace the sacrifice of the new. It may require you forgiving, mending relationships, going back and saying, I'm sorry, can we do this again? It may require you starting that business again. It may require you do something that you're not comfortable with, but you need to embrace the sacrifice of the new. I'm giving you the principles of starting all over. Forget the past, don't mourn the past forever. Accept the love of Jesus for you. Begin your purpose now. Now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't procrastinate. Don't say, well, Pastor, I'll think about it. And then next week, maybe I'll get to it. No, begin right now. Right from this service, begin. And embrace the sacrifice that is required for the new. For some of us, there are people we need to go say, I'm sorry to. Because you hurt them when you were behaving the whole way. For some of us, there are businesses you need to go start again. And it's going to be sacrifice starting from scratch.
But God is activating new beginnings in our lives. New beginnings in our walk with Christ. New beginnings in our finances, in our relationships. In what God has called us to do. Maybe God gave you a purpose and you made a train wreck of it. You can begin again. The resurrection tells us that newness <laughs> can begin again. There is therefore now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. And he says that everyone who is in Christ he is a new creation. The old has passed, the new has begun. Jesus is not holding your past against you if you would believe. We're going to bow our heads. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know if you're in this service and you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never committed your heart to him. You never really believed that you were, you were a terrible person. But man, you are. And it's only the sacrifice of Jesus that can save you. All he requires of you is to believe and accept his sacrifice for you. And if you want to do that this morning, I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to pray with you. You're here, you haven't believed that Jesus died for you and asked him to come into your heart. I'd like to pray for you because you cannot keep procrastinating. You cannot keep delaying this. If you don't receive this sacrifice of Jesus, the Bible says there is no more sacrifice for you. There's no more sacrifice. You will die and end up in condemnation. Death is not an escape. It's only a passage. When you die, you're going to be raised again to face the consequences of rejecting the sacrifice of Jesus. But today, right here, right now, you can turn it around. You can say, Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. And I want to begin anew. If you're that person in this hall or maybe at home, I'd like to pray with you. I'd like for you to place your hand just on your chest and I'm going to pray for you. If you're that person, you've never received Jesus as your Lord. In fact, you, you, you think that he doesn't want you. You cannot be worse than Peter. You cannot be worse than the disciples who deserted him and fled from him. The disciples who saw his miracles, saw all the wonderful things that he did. So if he called them back, he wants you back. So place your hand on your chest and we will pray together just right now. I'd like for you to say with me, Lord Jesus, I believe today that I'm a sinner. That there is sin in me. And I believe today that you died on the cross to pay for my sins. I ask that you would forgive me of all my sins and make me new. I believe that you were raised from the dead so that I may become a new creation. So I accept your forgiveness for my sins and I declare that you are Lord. By your spirit, make me a new creation even right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer with us, whether you're online, uh, if you're online, please leave a comment. Just let us know and we will get in touch with you. And you're, if you're in this room, um, come, come, come and see me after we close the service and I'll just help you uh, along your way in, in growing in the new life that you have received. We believe that as soon as you put your faith in Jesus, you are made new and you can begin to allow that newness to take over your life. You will not remain the same again. Oh, hallelujah.